All right, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, Charles, for, for having me. I'm excited to talk about this work. It's a new approach to unsupervised representation learning uh, with specific application to disentanglement. I worked on it with these people named on the slide, um, and like Charles said, in Matthias Betke's lab at the University of Tübingen. Uh, okay, so just get started. Uh, I'm just gonna, just as a quick overview, I'm gonna spend some time talking about disentanglement. Um, what is it, why is it important, where does it come from, what has been done so far, uh, and then I'll go into our approach for disentanglement, which includes introducing new data sets uh, intended to move the field towards more natural benchmarks. Um, so as Charles said, my background is in vision science, so I like to think about the task of disentanglement in the context of the human visual system. Um, generally, our task is to disentangle the original sources from the mixed signal that comes to our eye. Uh, and this is an extremely difficult task. Uh, one example of why is that our eyes have a 2D array of receptors and the world is in 3D. So for any image that would be projected under our eye, there's an infinite number of scenarios uh, that could uh, lead to that image. Uh, and this is also going to be true for disentangling from digital images or videos. Uh, and so in disentanglement, we have what we call sources. And some example of these sources are highlighted in red. Uh, they're pretty intuitive. They're basically just like the high level descriptors that one would use to explain a scene. Uh, and so for one observation that we can use to our advantage in the natural world is that certain properties of the world are generally persistent while others change. For example, if the tiger moves, it's still a tiger. Uh, or another example is as the day progresses, the lighting changes, the visual signal is going to change a lot, uh, but the tree is still a tree. Uh, and so you might notice that the two examples I just gave involve things that change over time, uh, and that's going to become important later when I explain our model. Uh, so ultimately, I'm interested in how the brain figures this out. None of the work that I'm going to present today is actually a proposal for specific computation of the brain. Um, we do provide a partial solution to this problem that exploits the statistics of the world. Uh, and we de demonstrate via an engineered approach that it's at least plausible that the brain could exploit such statistics as well. Um, so as with any problem in science, the first thing we want to do is simplify it as much as possible uh, and define it in co more concrete terms. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. here. Uh, on this slide in black, I have the steps that we'd be taking that are associated with disentanglement. In red, I have examples of what those steps might be. And in blue, I've assigned some variables to make it easier to talk about later. Um, so first, let's talk about the generator or the world. We have our sources, uh, which I'm calling S. Uh, and so in the case of like, for example, fake generated data, like in video games, we know exactly what those sources are. We have exact information for everything we need to make an image, like lighting and position, pose, identity. Um, for real world data, natural images and videos, uh, we don't know what all the sources are. We have to only guess. Uh, and these sources are mixed with the ground truth generative model. So for video games, it would be a graphics engine, and for natural signals, it's just like physical processes, light bouncing around, interacting with things in the world. And this mixture is a complicated process, produces these entangled signals, which we could think of as images, and then our goal is to try to disentangle that. Uh, so we want to learn something about this, this world process. One common next step is to use an encoder. So we want to recover sources from the mixed data uh, and produce a disentangled code, which we'll call latent code. Uh, many approaches also try to learn to generate new samples from the latent code. Uh, and so they learn to approximate the original ground truth generator and generate data samples. Um, so in our model, what we're gonna learn or things we could learn are the functions F and G, um, which could be neural networks or other algorithms. In our case, they're gonna be neural networks. Uh, and there's a few criteria that we might use to check to see if F and G are correct. Um, one is, does my latent code match my original sources? So if we have access to the original sources, we can just check that directly. Uh, does my encoder match the inverse of the ground truth generator? That sign that G star negative one means I'm looking at the inverse of that generator. Have I been able to undo that mixing process? Uh, or does my generator match the ground truth generator? And an easy way to check that is just, does my generated data look like the original ground truth data. And so if I generate a data set X, does it look like the data set X star? Uh, another common way to check that the latent code is sensible is to just purposefully vary the latent code Z and look at what happens in the generated images. So for example, if Z is a vector of 10 numbers and I want to vary just one of those numbers and I see that in my image, the size of an object changes without anything else changing, uh, then I can assign that specific number in Z a size label. 
Um, so there's a lot of different approaches to disentanglement, and these different approaches use or focus on different portions of this task. Uh, so for example, ICA, independent component analysis, is a really common one that dates back to the 80s, uh, and they only focus on the demixing part, the disentangling part. So the upsides of this type of algorithm is it's easy to consider, it's easier than considering the whole problem, uh, both in terms of the mathematical description and the applications. Uh, it really narrows down the true problem of disentanglement to the question of can we undo the process that happens in the real world. Uh, and another thing is it was proven a long time ago that it can produce identifiable solutions, which I'm gonna describe more in a few slides. However, some downsides are, one, we don't know, we don't have a good way of verifying that we preserved all of the information. So we don't really have a good way of checking that Z is, is, has all the information in X, whereas if we were regenerating data samples, then we would know for sure. And we also don't have a good way of generating new data, which has a lot of its own interesting applications. Um, so ICA has some been around for a very long time, and so there's a bunch of places where ICA gets used uh, in industry. Um, so some classic applications of ICA are the cocktail party problems. This is where you have a cocktail party, a bunch of people are talking, you have a couple of microphones in the room, uh, and you're recording all the conversations. And so the conversations are getting mixed, and then the goal is to demix that conversation or disentangle it so that the output is individual persons, uh, what they're saying. Another example of ICA is estimating the underlying structure of natural images. So people have shown that you can take a natural image as input, and the output is estimates of the core atomic elements that could be used to construct uh, those, those natural images, visual elements. I don't mean like literal atomic elements. Um, so another interesting application that I thought would be relevant with the recent or topical with the recent news on Neuralink is to look at brain data. So this is not the same type of data as Neuralink, but uh, still interesting nonetheless. And the reason why this is interesting is because uh, it allows me to, or it, it has relation to identifiability. So the task here is we have a EEG array. So it's just like a thing that goes in your head and it records brain activity. And the brain activity is coming from neurons. Neurons are producing electrical signals but they're getting mixed up. They're going through brain data, through skull, et cetera. Uh, and so if we train a disentangling model on ICA, the goal is to get out relevant signals that are relevant to cognition or action or whatever. Uh, and so identifiability is important in this case. Um, what identifiability means is that we can guarantee mathematically that the solution it finds is the correct solution. Uh, and there's different amounts of identifiability uh, from an exact match to a match up to permutations or up to some linear operation. Uh, it was shown a long time ago that ICA can do uh, identifiable disentanglement when the process is linear, but it's actually impossible to do it when the process is nonlinear for the standard ICA algorithm. Uh, and so there have been solutions proposed uh, for quite a while for nonlinear ICA, but only in the last five years or so have they really started making advancements to realistic data. And these solutions assume that you have some additional information that we need, uh, that we didn't need with regular ICA. Uh, so with linear ICA, we could solve the problem just with random samples of the data, but with nonlinear ICA, we need more information like a label or time step or some guarantee that a certain number of sources are only changing from one time point to another. So another alternative method for doing disentanglement is with generative adversarial networks or GANs. Uh, and so these kind of look at the second half of the problem only. Uh, they just generate data from random samples of a latent code and then check that that data looks realistic. Uh, so in practice, these are the most successful in terms of large scale data sets. They can work on high definition images, much higher scale data sets than ICA. Uh, but they're difficult to construct a good metric for assessing disentanglement because you've completely disregarded the original ground truth sources in the whole framework. Uh, and so there's no notion of identifiability and therefore the model itself is less interpretable. And another important difference is that we can't actually apply it to the same tasks that we could apply ICA to. Uh, we can't, I can't give you data and have you uh, pass it through your encoder and give me sources. <clears throat> uh, so the third approach is the one that we used, um, which is to use autoencoders. So the autoencoder approach uses all the steps above and the upsides is in theory, all of the same upsides as the other two. Uh, however, generally it works in practice on larger scale data than ICA, but smaller scale data than GANs. 
and until very recently, there were not any approaches to prove identifiability for uh, very auto encoder based models. Um, but some recent work has shown that you can uh, produce an unidentifiable disentanglement code. I don't have time to go into that now, but I'd encourage people to check out our paper uh, or the references on the screen uh, to look into those. So our approach is using an autoencoder, so I'm going to spend the rest of my time focusing on that. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the background. Now I'm going to go into our approach, uh, which will start with looking at benchmarks that are used uh, for this task. Um, so disentanglement task is best done when you have a, a, a metric uh, that you can use to assess the performance. And so a big advancement was made recently in this with the disentanglement library. Um, and so this library, they use a collected a bunch of different generative graphics engines. Uh, and so that means we know the exact parameters uh, used to generate images. Uh, and um, it allows us to be able to verify the ground truth generating sources with what comes out of our model. Um, so as I alluded to before, it's been known for like 20 years or so that it's not possible to perform identifiable disentanglement when you're only getting independent image samples. Uh, and so what we have done uh, is achieved this identifiable disentanglement by extending these data sets into the time domain and then using time information to constrain our model using the, the uh, statistics that we found to constrain our model. Uh, so when extending it to the time domain, we asked the question of what time statistics do we want to use? And we decided to try to use real data. Uh, so the first data set that we use is YouTube. Uh, so we pulled videos straight from YouTube. Uh, and then um, this other group uses a pre-training image segmentation algorithm to extract these binary masks. Uh, and so we take the masks and we record the measure the scale and position data of the masks. And then we construct our own sprite data set using the measurements that we have. And we call that natural sprites. Uh, so natural sprites are images generating using the Sprite World Graphics Engine. Uh, so they're simple, well-controlled objects. We know all the parameters, like the shape and orientation and everything. Uh, but we've added time component to the made them videos. And this, these statistics of this time match exactly the statistics from these YouTube videos. Uh, so this is a step, the first step towards running this problem on realistic videos. As a next step, we just we used the Kitty uh, data set. So this is masks extracted directly from self-driving car cameras. Uh, so we have these data set of videos from self-driving cars and the cars also have a LIDAR sensor. It's a laser depth sensor, uh, which makes it really good at detecting objects in the world. Uh, you know, if a person's in front of a car, they're going to be at a certain depth and everything else is going to be at a different depth. So it's easy to get a very fine grained mask. Uh, and so we Again, another group uses this information to extract these masks. We pulled out the human category uh, and converted it into this data set. And again, we measure the position and area of these ground truth factors. So this is, a, again, a further step closer towards real video. The downside of this compared to natural sprites is that we've, with natural sprites, we have all of the parameters for generating the video. We know exactly what parameters went into the generating model. Whereas here, we only have the position and area. Uh, we, we're just limited by what we can measure. Uh, so now that we have these data sets, we wanted to build a model that exploits this, the statistics of this data uh, or is constrained by the statistics of this data. So we measured those statistics. Um, so these are looking at the time varying statistics. So this is looking at transitions of these measurements from one frame to the next. And we found that the distributions are all sparse. So what that means is that they're peaked at zero uh, and they have very heavy tails. Uh, so that means sharp changes could occur in some latent sources, but most of the other sources would remain unchanged between adjacent time points. So now when I'm saying sources, I mean properties like position, identity, and stuff, uh, size. So as an example, if you imagine you're sitting in a traffic light and someone's going across the crosswalk, uh, that person's X position might change quite a bit in time, but their size and identity and shape are relatively constant. Using these, this idea, we decided to constrain our model by imposing a prior that adhered to this, uh, this, this statistic that we see. Uh, so again, we have an autoencoder model. We get images 
uh, x. Um, you can see on my pointer here, and then it goes through an encoder to get our latent code z. And what we do is we establish a prior on our model uh, to impose this regularity that we saw uh, in the natural data. Uh, and so here, this is represented here by this heat map. Uh, so the darker red indicates a higher probability. So for the first time step, we don't really know anything about it. So we have a very general prior that we place in the model. Uh, and that's signified here. And the next time step, this is the, or sorry, this is the encoding at that first time step. So now we actually have seen the object and we know where it is, which we mark by the X and we have some probability distribution around it. We, given that information, we can enforce another prior of the time step T given time step T minus one. And this is the one that we ask to be sparse. So we again say that we only want a few of the latents to change, but we only expect a few of the latents to change. And now when we encode the next time step, because we have imposed this prior, we have a high likelihood of doing a good job at encoding the next time step. And I'm not gonna go into it very much, but it turns out that having this sparse prior because it is shaped the way it is, it allows us to prove identifiability with a very simple proof. Um, okay, so we applied this to, to both the data sets in the disentanglement lib, as well as our new data sets. Uh, and we found that we did a lot better than previous approaches. This is a really big plot, there's a lot going on. I'm just gonna highlight the important points, most notably the red circle around our model, which does the best. Uh, and the way you can interpret these green boxes here is this is looking at the correlation between the latent components in Z and the ground truth factors. So each column is a different ground truth factor. So ideally, if it was a perfect solution, you would just see a dark green row uh, diagonal of 100. Uh, indicating that every ground truth factor is perfectly correlated with one of the latents. Uh, and another way to look at it is to just look at the values themselves. So here what we're doing is we're changing uh, those latent values and we're looking at how Z, or sorry, we're changing the ground truth values and we're looking at how Z changes with respect to that. And so again, a perfect solution would be a diagonal line or in the case of shape where there's discrete categories, we would just have separated points. Uh, and you can see that like a solution like this, for example, it'd be very difficult to decode what the X position was given a value of Z. Uh, um, so the summary of some advantage of the advantages to our approach, uh, it's parsimonious. So our mathematical setup is simple. It can be applied to a lot of different data types, including videos with natural transitions. It's identifiable. So we prove that our model is more identifiable than previous approaches. By more, I mean, we have fewer constraints. It's applicable to broader set of data, broader uh, amount of data sets, uh, and it's identifiable up to permutations as opposed to up to something like a linear transformation, which previous approaches were. Uh, and then we also just empirically show improved disentanglement on these more constrained data sets. Ultimately, our goal is to move towards natural data. Um, but we believe that we've offered these data sets as a way to help push the field in that direction. Uh, yeah, and that's what I got. So this is the links that you can go to to check out more. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Open to questions. Great. So if folks have questions, you can put them in the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat, and we'll pose them to Dylan. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Andrew, if you have questions, it'd be great to hear uh, any questions that you have. I'll kick us off with a couple of questions. So uh, the first question is, what do you think is needed to take these nonlinear disentanglement approaches and be able to apply them to you know, full you know, high definition natural video? Is it just calculation? Is it just like computation rather? Or is there, are there big algorithmic advances that need to be made? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. So it's not really clear what, so like autoencoders by themselves are capable of encoding and decoding high resolution images. Um, when you stick them in this variational framework, so this probabilistic framework where you're not just adding, asking it to encode an image and then decode that image, but you're also asking for the encoding to have these certain properties, it seems like the scalability kind of falls off. Uh, and so this might come down to just the network's ability to approximate this probabilistic distribution, which is what it's trying to do with variational inference. Uh, and so one thing that we're working on 
now with continuing this is to modify the architecture to an architecture that can handle uh, like a recurrent architecture that can handle more complicated computation uh, without having to have an extremely deep network. Mm. Um, and so we're hoping that we can go farther with fewer layers uh, to, to try to scale up the model. Um, interesting. So Joshua Clancy from YouTube asks, how did you implement those priors? So how are those priors enforced on the, on the autoencoder? Sure, yeah. So it ends up just being a training loss, but it comes from a probabilistic description. So the variational autoencoder basically specifies that the uh, encoder itself solves a lower bound on uh, likelihood of the representation given the images. Uh, and so we end up with a loss function that is a uh, term that asks that information is preserved as much as possible. So that's basically looking at the difference between X star and X. And then a second term that says that we want the latent space to look as much as possible like draws, random draws from these two probability distributions um, where, let's see, go back to the slide. So the one probability distribution is this, just a standard Gaussian prior. So this is the standard prior that's used in all VAEs. And then we added a second probability distribution. Given the first time point, we encode the first image. We use that image to condition our second prior. Uh, and then when we feed in the second image, we have a loss term for the, the second image using the second prior. So it ends up just being the same KL divergence or similar KL divergence term that you get in the standard VAE framework. Interesting. While we're on this slide, I think I just wanted to sort of check my understanding of your identifiability proof. The like essence of it is basically that if you look at that prior t given t minus one, you can see that it's axis aligned, right? That you see those two uh, like sharp lines oriented up, uh, up and horizontally and vertically. And that's what gives you identifiability that the axes are really important as opposed to that Gaussian prior where it's, you know, isotropic. And so there's no special directions of any kind. Yeah, exactly. So the, the prior that you're looking at here for T minus one, that's a, just a standard Gaussian prior, which is used for beta VAEs and other VAE approaches to disentanglement. And the problem with this prior is it's rotationally symmetric. So what that means is in my latent space, I can multiply my Z variable by a rotation matrix that can rotate at any arbitrary amount, and it would still be equally valid under our loss function. And so there's no way of knowing, given the loss, whether we actually found the right solution or not. Because the ground truth has one solution, and our latent has infinite solutions, depending on what rotation you do. And that's actually the core argument for ICA not being identifiable. Uh, and so, yeah, the shape of our prior, the fact that we chose a sparse prior, it has these axis-aligned probability densities, uh, marginals, that, that means that when you rotate it, it's not the same anymore. And so if it minimizes the loss. If it finds a solution, it is the right solution. And I should say that with this kind of stuff, like identifiability is proven in this, you know, mathematical sense. And of course, we have to relax a lot of those constraints when we apply the model in practice. Uh, and so it was important for us to do a lot of empirical tests at the same time. We show identifiability, but we also want to make sure that you know, when we relax the constraints that we needed to impose to show identifiability to actually run it on real data, we still see a good job at disentanglement. So when you look at the results, like, no, it's not perfect, uh, but it's doing a lot better than everyone else. And at, in theory, given the right conditions, it should do perfectly. And we do test it on toy data, like very toy data, where it exactly matches all the conditions and then it perfectly disentangles it. Cool. Uh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, this is interesting work and I'm looking forward to see as you continue closer towards nonlinear disentanglement, uh, in natural data, uh, and, uh, hopefully folks take up these data sets that you put out there, that kitty mask data set, um, and, you know, improve on this and, and, uh, make some steps towards better disentangling natural videos. Yeah, so a lot of the, the Yash and Lucas and David, they did a lot of work on the GitHub repository. So if you're interested in trying this out, you, the, that same repo is where you go to get the data uh, and also where you would go to test out our model. Um, and it integrates pretty well with the disentanglement library already and the metrics that they use. Uh, 